Well, if you've noticed any of the pictures, and we have one over in the chapel, of any of the earlier restoration leaders, you know, some of them have sort of long beards, you know, and certainly is an indication of how fashion, you know, trends change over time. When I came here, it was very clear you could not have facial hair if you were a professor. Um, maybe a mustache was allowed, but certainly nothing that looked like any of the reformers. I look around the room here, I see people who would not be allowed in those days. It just, you look too much like a hippie or a communist or something, whatever it was, it was not, <laughs> it was not allowed. Um, fashions change in terms of clothes. Uh, tattoos, you know, are sort of much more acceptable now than in those days. I keep telling my wife, I'm not, one of these days I'm going to have an ear stud, and she said, not yet. <laughs> said, not yet, you're not. I said, okay, dear. Um, and the same is true with doctrinal emphases. You know, some generations, some things are in, and sort of other times they're out, and that's true. Denominationally, it's true over centuries. You know, some things are in, some things are out. And um, I think it's true in our spiritual biographies. You know, there are times sort of in our journey, some things are more important to us than others. And so I want to talk about... Um, sort of a facet of people's biography that uh, maybe needs to be a part of, you know, your own biography your whole life, but maybe not. It depends. I think we're all sort of different creatures and have different personalities. But the notion I want to talk about this morning is the um, most embarrassment we have at times to feel good about claiming righteousness based on our behavior as opposed to this widespread Protestant notion of imputed righteousness which is a good doctrine. Obviously, it's there in Scripture, the fact that, um, you know, we don't have anything to brag about in the presence of God. Um, and Scripture is really clear. We, we, you know, we're saved by grace, through faith, not of works, lest any person should boast. There's no ground for boasting. But on the other hand, once all that's settled and clear, uh, Scripture does have things to say about the place of the fact that there are people who scripture uh, comments on the fact that they are righteous people based on their behavior. And so I want to talk about that because the other, the other doctrine has been abused over the centuries. Um, this doctrine that the church, for example, is a hospital. Um, that's okay is if you don't have that as your entire doctrine of the church where it's just for sick people and we're all just sick all the time and come here and just be sick with us, you know? And Jesus is the great healer, and we just all sit around and be sick. You know, hospitals are to make you well and you leave, right? You heal, you leave restored and healthy and get on with life. Um, or that we're just all beggars, you know, looking for some bread. Those are all good illustrations up to a point, but when that becomes the only, illustra only, only illustration you use, then it becomes very detrimental. And the same is true of this notion, I think, that uh, claims of righteousness based on our behavior are somehow a uh, false gospel. So I want to start with the parents of John the Baptist uh, in Luke. And remember that Luke is the main author of the New Testament. He writes more of the New Testament than Paul, than Paul does. And uh, he's a favorite author of, of people who sort of claim social gospel, who love texts like Luke 4 and Jesus and the Argo Sermon in the Nazareth Synagogue. So, right, we all love Luke. Um, so we've got to love this presentation and the message here. So Luke 1, verses 5 and 6, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah and his wife Elizabeth. She's the descendant of Aaron. So these are, these are people who are temple people. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. Okay, so there's a connection between their righteousness in the sight of God and the fact that they observe the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. Now, Luke didn't believe they were sinless, okay? He wasn't trying to get them under, your, under the wire before Jesus died on the cross as somebody who didn't need Jesus' death or something, okay? But Judaism understands that you have the sacrificial system to take care of the sins of the people. But on the other hand, you're supposed to be Torah observant, and when you are, then your life is characterized as blameless. 
Do you walk in the Torah of God? Do you walk in God's wisdom? You, you, you delight in it. Just read Psalm 119, Psalm 19, and a host of other texts. And when you do, you have a righteousness that comes from God because you, your behavior imitates God's behavior, which is a very New Testament theme, by the way. And as your behavior imitates the behavior of God, you have righteousness based on your lifestyle. And this is exactly what he's, the way Luke is describing Zechariah and Elizabeth. So in that light, I want to read parts of Psalm 18. It's a great psalm. And I think that the language here would make some Christians feel uncomfortable. Some Christians might even think, well, that's just these old primitive Jewish ways of thinking, and now the, Jesus has come. We know that Judaism is just a bunch of legalistic foolishness. Not at all. This is exactly the way Jesus would have thought. It is his Bible. This is the Bible that Jesus heard about growing up. This is one that instructed him in his understanding of righteousness. So Psalm 18, there's 20 following. Don't have time to read the whole psalm. The Lord has dealt with me according to my righteousness, according to the, de according to the cleanness of my hands. He has rewarded me. For I have kept the ways of the Lord. I am not <clears throat> guilty of turning away from my God. All his laws are before me. I have not turned away from his decrees. I have been blameless before him and have kept myself from sin. Now, he's not, Psalmist is not saying he doesn't need the sacrificial system. Okay? That's not what's going on here. The Lord has rewarded me according to my righteousness according to the cleanness of my hands in his sight. To the faithful you show yourself faithful, to the blameless you show yourself blameless. And he, as you're aware, this is the same kind of language that was used of John the Baptist's parents. To the pure you show yourself pure, but to the devious you show yourself shrewd. You save the humble, <clears throat> but bring those whose eyes are haughty, bring low those whose eyes, whose eyes are haughty. So that, that's a way Christians ought to feel good about themselves if they are walking in the light of Scripture and if they um, you know, claim to be followers of Christ and live, certainly not live lives that are sinless. I'm not talking about that. And certainly 1 John is very clear. Anyone who says that they don't sin is a liar, right? So we're not talking about sinlessness. We're not talking about some heretical doctrine of perfectionism. But we're talking about people who know what the light of Christ is. They know what that path looks like. And they walk in that path. And on occasion, they step out of that path. And when they step out of that path, they realize it, or the community realizes it, or they study in the Bible and they realize it, or the Holy Spirit tells them they're out of it, they get back in the path. Those people are walking in the light. Their sins are always being forgiven. Okay? And they're blameless. Okay? Just like the psalmist is. Now, we come to these antitheses in Matthew 5. Um, you know, you've heard that it was said to the men of old, but I say to you, hopefully you know that part of the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 5. There is a, a little preamble to that I want to talk about quickly. It says, um, For I tell you that unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. What I think is going on there is that Jesus is saying that his followers will have a righteousness that has to, they have to have one that exceeds. If they want to get into the kingdom, they have to have a righteousness that exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees. And he's not talking about you just sit there and claim you're a wretched sinner you're just one level above, uh, you know, a cockroach, you know, or a slug or something. And you just sit there and say, yes, I'm a wretched sinner. Save me, Jesus. The righteousness that exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees is the behavior he's getting ready to talk about in the next verses. And that's part of what these antitheses are. It's, it's significant that it's the next section. And so the righteousness is when... All these statements, you know them, right? When he says, you've heard that it was said, right? This is how you've heard the traditions of the scribes and Pharisees teach you, so-and-so and so-and-so, but I say to you, those are the antitheses. And so, 
whether it's lusting in your heart or whether it's hatred or whether it's how you take oaths, whatever it is, there's a way to do that in a way that exceeds what the scribes and Pharisees teach, in a way sort of it's normally understood in Judaism. And so these have to do with lifestyle. They have to do with ways you live your life. And they're ways that, are, that produce a kind of righteousness in your life. And so Jesus is saying in these antitheses that consume a good part of chapter 5 of Matthew that based on your behavior, you produce a kind of righteousness. So um, I think this is just a, an example of where we see that in Jesus himself uh, talking to his um, apostles and others in the crowd. Uh, then I want to turn to 1 John chapter 3, verse 7. He says, Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right, right, just as he is righteousness. Okay? And so John is saying that the person who does right, that person is righteous. Okay? Now, again, let me say, certainly there are texts that talk about imputed righteousness. Okay? But their text in 1 John 3 is one of those where it talks about your behavior, right? When you have behavior that's righteous, then that's what produces your righteousness. And so we as Christians need to let people know as they stand in the sight of God, part of who they are as a righteous individual is not just that they say, yes, I'm an unworthy sinner. I can't do it. We all are in church. We're just helpless people. And so we are just going to acknowledge each, each other's helplessness and we're going to continue to lower the bar because we're all sinners and not hold anybody accountable because we're all are just ungodly, you know, people. We need to have the bar, you know, up higher sometimes in our theology because the righteousness God is look, that God is looking for is not just imputed righteousness, but a righteousness that is based on our behavior. Okay, that it's a righteousness that exceeds the scribes and the Pharisees. Then we have this wonderful text in the book of Revelation. Wonderful text. Revelation 19.6. Um, and by the time we get to Revelation 19, the story's about over. Okay, this great drama that's been going on, getting close to the end. And of course, everybody, if you watch television, at least religious television, you can't take much of it, but you know, if you sort of pull back the curtain and peek occasionally. Um, everybody's waiting for chapter 20 in the millennium. But in the 19 is where you have the four occurrences of the word hallelujah. You know, those are the only four uh, in the New Testament where you have the, the word hallelujah. And 19 is where you have Jesus on the white horse, you know, in the big battle that's uh, depicted in terms of Gog and Magog battle in the book of Ezekiel. But verse 6 following says, Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and the loud peals of thunder, shouting, Hallelujah! For our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride, and the bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. Okay? And so the, the, the linen that the bride wears, right? These, these are not the, um, the righteous acts of Christ. These are the righteous acts that are given um, to us based on what we do. And how do we know what we do? What we do that are righteous acts, well, we're told by God what they are. Right? It's not like we're wandering around in a fog, not knowing what God expects of us in terms of what righteous acts look like. So, a text I've referred to earlier when I've spoken in chapel recently, I want to refer to it again, 2 Timothy 3, 16. But at that point, I wasn't referring to this theme. All Scripture... Is God breathed or inspired? Is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and <clears throat> training in righteousness. So, how is the church, how are the disciples of Jesus going to know what in the world we're supposed to be doing that trains us in behavior of righteousness? 
How are we supposed to know that faith and justice and mercy are the way to your matters of the law? You certainly wouldn't get that information by looking at the history of God's people. That isn't what they've taught. Right? If you look at church history, you wouldn't get that. Chances are pretty good if you looked at your own congregation, you wouldn't get that. If you looked at the history of Judaism, you wouldn't get that. If you looked at the history of other world religions, you wouldn't get that. The reason we know that is God tells us so. Right? The Bible tells us so. That's how we know that. And the way we know what is important to the Creator, not just to this wonderful solar system or to the Milky Way, but the whole thing, is He tells us what's important. Right? He tells us what are the deeds of righteousness. And so Paul continues in 2 Timothy 3, continuing into verse 17, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. That's how we are clothed in righteous deeds as the bride of Christ. And we can stand before God with our own kind of righteousness, not boasting, not self-righteous. None of those pejorative, negative things that are hostile to the gospel. Absolutely, for sure. But of a kind of righteousness that 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, the Bible is trying to train us in. But somehow we're sort of embarrassed to talk about you know, because somewhere along the way, we've listened more to evangelical rhetoric or Reformation rhetoric or people who are still reacting to the Church of Christ of their grandparents. I don't know what, but anyway, they're listening to something other than sort of the whole counsel of God of what the Scripture teaches about righteousness. Certainly, there's no ground for boasting about works, you know, or, or thinking righteousness consists of these other things, like tithing from your, you know, spices, or, you know, uh, going to the temple all the time, or doing religious services all the time, or a host of other things that religious people create as, and thinking that's what it is. Most of what Christianity has put forward has been false. So it's really important that we have the compass from God that he gives us the scripture. But it's, it's really important that you understand the culture can't give us the right compass, and sadly, history teaches us God's people can't give us the compass. They, they just can't. <laughs> they fail every time, unless they get it from Scripture. And when they do, then we know what righteousness looks like, and when we do, we should feel comfortable in saying, brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so, is a righteous person. And, and their lives are just clothed with righteousness. And they do righteous things. And they stand righteous before God. And they are blameless in the sight of God. And if a person knows the Bible, if their worldview is constructed out of the language of the Bible, and you describe someone who's a, who's a faithful Christian as blameless in the sight of God, they won't misunderstand that at all. They'll know exactly what that means because they'll know about John the Baptist's parents and Psalm 18 and a host of other texts. They might even know 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Who knows? Let's pray. God, we are grateful for your patience with us. Uh, we're grateful for sacred scripture. We're thankful that you... Um, have given us uh, the path in which we should walk, that you've created good works in which we should walk in our entire lives, that even though we're not saved by our works, you've created works for us to walk in. We thank you for that. Help us to encourage one another to good works. We're grateful for your spirit, which encourages us and guides us in good works. 
Bless all of us here today. Bless this institution. Bless the folks who make this possible. In Jesus' name, amen.